Alright, hey, hey all. Uh, now we're gonna keep going through the location of culture, uh, beginning with the chapter Signs Taken for Wonders. So Signs Taken for Wonders, the, the title of the chapter itself comes from <clears throat> comes from a, a colonialist text uh, where, where uh, Baba writes that it is with the emblem of the English book, Signs Taken for Wonders, <clears throat> as an insignia of colonial authority and a signifier of colonial desire and discipline that I want to begin this chapter. And then he gives, he provides a really, a very long uh, excerpt from the book that I won't go into reading, but it's there. And he summarizes it as follows. Written as they are in the name of the Father and the Author, these texts, of the civilizing mission immediately suggests the triumph of the colonialist moment in early English evangelism, evangelism and modern English literature, which is very indicative of the books of the time, because what what good would a book have been for the uh, for the state or the um, the home base? And yeah, what good would such texts have been if they didn't celebrate the triumph of these uh, colonial missions? Now this is indicative of texts that, that came much later. Take for instance uh, Conrad's Heart of Darkness that Baba spent some time thinking about, which is a text kind of ironically uh, exploring the malaise or, or the negative impacts of colonialism while simultaneously denying a voice to those, those uh, colonial subjects, colonized subjects, reserving the voice for, you know, even the colonial figures in that in that text. It's like how the film American History X is a uh, is a a racist film about racism. It's ironic in the way that it works as such, but it is not so much a challenge, not so much a critique, as it is in some ways an extension. What is striking about Heart of Darkness, however, and it's something that um, Baba kind of sifts out, which which was omitted from the earlier colonial texts was that there is a recognition of a sort of messiness right behind the sort of colonialism as he writes the horror the horror quoting heart of darkness must not be repeated in the drawing rooms of Europe lest of course it risk destabilizing the very um, profitable the very appreciated colonial movements of that time so what Conrad's text gets at, in a sense, and this is following Baba's argument in the previous chapters, notably the kind of ambivalence behind identity, where the colonial or the colonizer can be both, you know, father and authority figure, father and, you know, child, in a sense, how there are all these, these kind of contradictory elements at play. What Conrad's text reveals in Heart of Darkness is that this these endeavors, notably the colonial ones, were something that did not have a steady, I will say telos, a, a steady goal, precisely because of their uh, the rampant negative effects that they, that, that followed. So to this sort of colonial power that does not manifest itself in any sort of clear way, that does not give itself a face, does not then inscribe upon itself a certain locus, a certain locus of power that can then be overthrown, Baba suggests that resistance is not necessarily an oppositional act of political intention, nor is it the simple negation of exclusion of the content of another culture as a difference once perceived. It is rather the effect of an ambivalence produced within the rules of recognition of dominating discourses as they articulate the signs of cultural difference. So in this way, Bob is sketching uh, a, mo a modality of resistance that matches, in part, the sort of ambivalence associated with, or that he observes, oh, the cats are fighting, that he observes in the colonizer. So discrimination, or discrimination effects, are produced through the strategy of disavowal. The reference of discrimination is always to a process of splitting as the condition of subjection. So in this way, in very much the same way that, that colonial uh, colonizing subject, sorry for the cats, colonizing subject is something that is split. 
something that is kind of fractalized, what we see, we see the same thing occurring within the colonial subject. Through this process of discrimination as well, we see a sort of mutation, right? We see a hybrid figure sort of emerge. But it's not as though it only comes out in that instance, but it's something that is exacerbated, kind of made, pushed to its extreme form. Oh my god. Pushed to its extreme form that gives it that oppressive formulation. But at the same time, it is, it is precisely this form of hybridity in that it is the manifestation of what the col colonizing subject refuses to acknowledge, that there is no set telos, a sort of um, you know positive dialectic moving in, in, in some kind of direction. Rather, what we're seeing is this kind of arrested development, in a sense, or what we can even, you know, arrested development and dialectic do not go hand in hand, but it is either no movement at all or a, reg or a regression, sort of negative dialectic. So when the colonial subject is turned into this sort of fractalized hybrid figure, and if we can accept, as Baba was made, made clear in the first few chapters, that the colonial subject or that person being colonized or that has been colonized in a, is in a sense a kind of unheimlich figure of the colonizer, then they, precisely because of their manifestation of, the, of that sort of hybridity, it turns its gaze back onto the colonizing subject, renders them that same form of hybridity, undoing the kind of finality associated with that project. So for Baba, hybridity is the revaluation of the assumption of colonial identity through the repetition of discriminatory identity effects, this sort of iteration coming back here, that, that, that repetitiveness. So there is a sort of transparency attached to the hybrid figure in that it is a very clear manifestation of what the colonizing subject refuses to acknowledge within themselves. So in that way, it's a, it's a transparency that is, that is negative. It is a transparency that is something that, they, they, that shouldn't be transparent, lest the colonizing subject wishes to maintain their uh, positionality, their kind of um, superior position, if I can call it that. Whereas the sort of localization of a, of a power within the colonizing subject, and this is the way in which we, we I think traditionally would understand the relationship between colonizer and colonized uh, represents a sort of positive transparency, whereas it, it is that form of overt of the overt demonstration of power that maintains such power in a sense that keeps it going, that maintains that you know superior positionality. So Baba takes this time at least to think about the difference between a fetish object and a hybrid object. So for Baba, the fetish reacts to the change in the value of the phallus by fixing on an object prior to the perception of difference, an object can, that can metaphorically substitute for its presence while registering the difference. So then we move on to the hybrid object, which is, on the other hand, it retains the actual semblance of the authoritative symbol but revalues its presence by resisting it as the signifier of instalon, which only occurs after the intervention of difference. So there is a sort of neutrality present in the fetish object. It, is just, it could be anything that uh, this sort of, what I'll just say, lipidinal drives or, or sort of uh, unconscious drives are imputed upon, kind of made to fit that mold in a sense. Whereas the hybrid object can only come into fruition after there has been some sort of contact in order to differentiate it from something else, right? And that way it's, it becomes split, it becomes caught between worlds, and it is then, in a sense, given that, given that status as hybrid. So then, Baba kind of gives us a sort of strange passage here, kind of strange goal of colonial authority. And it goes as follows. For the desire of colonial discourse is a splitting of hybridity that is less than one and double. And if that sounds enigmatic, it is because its explanation has to wait for the authority of those canny questions that the natives put 
so insistently to the English book. Now, what does that mean? It's it's a by reducing the colonized to a status less than one or or double precisely because the double represents that sort of split figure, that hybrid figure that challenges said authority. And the one, I believe in my mind, would give it too much of a, I guess, a singularity, something that cannot be changed, something that is kind of grounded. It, the colonial project is to reduce them beyond those points, or I guess to render them less than those in a form of dehumanization, if you will, rendering them mappable, rendering them subject to the eye of power that derives from the colonial uh, point of view. And on that note, we'll move into the next chapter. And really, I'm trying my best not to be repetitive. Baba is very repetitive, and it seems as though he says the same thing in as many different ways as he can, with as many different literary sources as he can with only kind of minor variations throughout the chapters. But for, for those that have read this, or, or that are going to read it, just be warned that, that it is rather repetitive, and I'm just trying to sift out the, the little nuances throughout it. So moving into the next chapter, uh, chapter 7, Articulating the Archaic. So in this chapter, it kind of starts out by thinking about the untranslatability, kind of the unspeech of the colonial discourse. So he goes back to, you know, many literary examples. I will stick to Heart of Darkness because I feel like that's the one most people are familiar with, um, where he states that in, in Conrad's Heart of Darkness, Marlowe seeks Kurtz's voice, his words, a stream of light, or the deceitful flow from the heart of an impenetrable darkness. And, the, and in that search, he loses what is in the work, the chance to find yourself. So then he goes on, he continues on the next page, Kurtz is just a word, not the man with the name. Marlowe is just a name, lost in the narrative game. In the terrific suggestiveness of words heard in dreams, of phrases spoken in nightmares. So then what he, what he uses, for, or what he takes from this, uh, to say that what emerges from the dispersal of work is the language of a colonial nonsense that displaces those dualities in which the colonial space is traditionally divided nature, culture, chaos, and civility. So what we are left with then is somewhere between being and meaning, between the subject and the other, neither the one nor the other. Now does this necessarily come about, I ask, of through the colonial experience, or is this always already indicative of any given societal setup, some kind of any culture? Is, it, is there always this process of a sort of fractalization, a sort of splitting? Now, if I think to um, Odiard, for instance, for a moment, uh, for him, this kind of gets subsumed under the category singularity. So singularity is the sort of perfection of any given cultural system at any given time. However, when I read that, it's not as though any, any one culture or whatever is resistant to change, but actually how change is embedded within singularity. So I, I like to think of this in that way, where there is that sort of uh, splitting effect always occurring. There's always that process of change of development, the sort of dialectic, if you will, that moves these things perpetually forward. Now, when the, you know, if, when the colonizers come in, does that now mark a sort of repressive hybridity? Perhaps there's something to say about that. And how do you necessarily differentiate or distinguish the two? To which Baba responds, sort of giving something of an answer where he states that uh, for the colonial cultural signifier is precisely the radical loss of such a homologous or dialectical assemblage of part and whole, metaphor and metonymy. Instead of cross-referencing, there is an effective, productive cross-cutting across sites of social significance that erases the dialectical disciplinary sense of cultural reference and relevance. So in that sense, it's the opening up, or I guess I should say closing off, of that sort of possibility that occurs in the colonial moment. 
So in a sense, he gives us these uh, kind of words of wisdom where he states that to be true to himself, one must learn to be a little untrue, out of joint with the signification of cultural generalizability, or to recognize in a sense the impossibility of recognizing or consolidating a sort of singular uh, cultural identity or sort of cultural framework. And really the, the rest of this chapter is, is a lot like before how there is that necessity for the splitting, necessity for uh, the unheimlich or the, the effect that the unheimlich has, and to kind of just jump right past that into the next chapter, uh, I, I think wouldn't be that much of a disservice. But everyone, please go and read it. But this is, uh, otherwise I think we would just be going in circles and over and over again. But now moving into chapter 8, uh, which I will just do, titled Dissemination, we start to get into some new territory here. So to disseminate the act of spreading, in a sense, of kind of uh, distributing, is undercut here with the notion um, of nationhood. So how do you deliver the notion of a nation? How do you make that idea apparent? So as an act, or sorry, as an apparatus of symbolic power, it, the nation, produces a continual slippage of categories like sexuality, class affiliation, territorial paranoia, or cultural difference in the act of writing the nation. So what is displayed in this displacement and repetition of terms is the nation as the measure of the liminality of cultural modernity. So there is a sort of, in the idea of the nation, there is, um, there demands a sort of homogenization in the writing of said nation. There needs to be some kind of establishment of, of an identity that can be understood, grasped, kind of placed on the world map chart. So as everyone else, so that everyone else may understand what exactly that nation represents and the people inside it may do, may, may as well. Now, this is all on paper, of course, and it isn't really the reality, which is what Baba's getting at, precisely because, as he just stated, um, it produces a continual slippage of categories. So an example that I like to use to think about this is that someone in take uh, someone in Maine has much more of an affiliation with someone in southern Quebec than they do with someone in Alaska. Yet this notion of nation groups those two people together, the person in Maine and the person in Alaska, and then separates the person in Maine from the person from southern Quebec, even though, as far as the geography goes, the political landscape goes, there are very there there are affinities between the two that people don't have between Maine and Alaska, for instance. So, what is this sort of myth of the nation, and why is its myth something that is is always sort of failing that doesn't necessarily capture the multitude of perspectives the kind of um, these slippages but rather perpetually denies them in their homogenization or in their reduction to a sort of single point how do we then understand the homogeneity of modernity the people which if pushed too far may assume something resembling the archaic body of the despotic or totalitarian mass in the midst of progress and modernity, the language of ambivalence reveals a politics without duration, as, at, as Althusser once provocatively wrote, space without places, time without duration. We may begin by questioning that progressive metaphor of modern social cohesion, the many as one, shared by organic theories of the holism of culture and community, and by theorists who treat gender, class, or race as social totalities that are expressive of unitary, collective experiences, which it just goes completely against what he's, what Baba has been doing throughout the course of this book so far, is thinking about the way in which cultural identity is split, is always part of this sort of, or indicative of a sort of hybrid figure. This stands in opposition to how he's laying out the nation, which I tried to do myself uh, a little earlier. So the question of democracy, the question of 
I guess, any sort of political organization is really called into question because how do you possibly represent um, a sort of splitting, right? And, you know, the big news conglomerates have reduced it to just two options, essentially, which give us the semblance of a sort of splitting. But this is a splitting that is fractalized to the extent that you can never sort of reduce, you, you could never reduce it to just two sides. Yet we have these sort of cathartic releases as far as the political arena goes, especially in the United States, with this sort of right-left politics that gives us the idea that there is something of an ambiguity present. That there is always the possibility, not only of the left or the right, of the in-between, which a number of people take up in this sort of liber not so much libertarian, but centrist type politics that sort of indifferent political action Which seems like a oxymoron, but it's something that, that I think in a sense has been growing, you know, neither left nor right type people. But for Baba, all of this would simply be, um, you know, a spectacle, right? The stage that is intended to, in part, convince us of this element that we haven't crushed, all right, through all our colonial experiences, all our colonial uh, motivations, but that it is something that continues on, in, in at least in the media sphere and in politics and those things that govern our, our daily lives. Counter-narratives of the nation, then, that continually evoke and erase its totalizing boundaries for Baba, both actual and conceptual, disturb those ideological maneuvers through which imagined communities are given essentialist identity. This is, be this is because, as, we've stated, as I've stated, that the nation is that force that homogenizes, and that is precisely because of the condition in which it, it finds itself. Now, if we think of... Um, Mm, I think Esposito would be good for this, but if we think of the case for a sort of uh, biopolitical argument where the state or the nation represents something of a body, um, then we might poke some, be able to poke some holes in this precisely because that there needs to be a recognition of the way in which viruses or that thing that stands opposed to the body or opposed to the immune system that maintains the body are necessary for the survival of the body, right? So viruses play a crucial role in strengthening the body's immune system, right? So in this sense, if we think of the nation state in such a way, then it is necessary in part for there to be uh, opposing elements introduced into the system in sort of homeopathic doses. Now. Well, this is all well and good, and it is something that um, that Baba suggests, but I feel like there is a tendency in his work, even though his whole project is, is opposed to this, there is a tendency for him to, to you know, kind of look down upon uh, the nation-state or the contemporary forms of whatever might constitute a nation, which I'm, I totally agree with, but I think he could be clearer in the way in which it, it stands separate from the old colonial missions and that it's how it stands separate from you know the pre-colonial age or ages but I'll go on to explain how he kind of deals with that himself and he, he does this it comes out in little moments like when he says that the subject is graspable only in the passage between telling and told between here and somewhere else and in this double scene the very condition of cultural knowledge is the alienation of the subject so how there is something of how this liminality, how this sort of splitting is in a sense retained, how it does still manifest itself in, in rather obscure forms, but it does still come into fruition, right? Which I think would allow, when he speaks about something like counter-narratives, there are those moments of, of resistance, of that sort of ambiguity, the kind of remnants of it. In effect, then, Baba writes that the finitude of the nation emphasizes the impossibility of such an expressive totality. So this is very ironic, given the way in which he's been kind of framing it up till now. It seems as though he's always thinking about the way in which the nation falls short of actually completing this sort of colonial project, or this homogenizing project, to which he, from which he turns to Foucault to think about the way in which Foucault 
theorizing the sort of individual individuality of those people that fall outside of the purview of the system of, of the state, think about the, the, the mad or the sick or the deviant, anything like that, how those people mark a sort of uh, continuation of this, I guess, positive system or the thing that Baba wants to see be maintained. And from Foucault, he moves into um, those, those people that uh, are the most indicative of the sort of Foucaultian individualism that he outlined, or that he presented. And those are for him uh, minorities and women, or you know, people of color and women especially. But he turns to Kristeva to bring up an interesting point. So for what he states is that the borders of the nation Kristeva claims are constantly faced with a double temporality, the process of identity constituted by historical sedimentation in brackets, the pedagogical, and the loss of identity in the signifying process of cultural identification. They're performative. So there are these two forces that work in the sort of construction of the nation that, that do stand opposed to one another, where one, the pedagogical and the sort of didactic uh, approach to establishing a state or a nation, and then the performative, the one that doesn't necessarily lay like, claim to a voice but that is very much part in the construction of such, uh, such an idea in the form of the nation. So when crafting a sort of resistance, Baba, like, like how, we, how this book began, wants to resist the kind of uh, multiculturalism argument or the multiculturalism idea that floats around. So he states that it is in the supplementary, su supplement, supplementary space of doubling, not plurality, where the image is presence and proxy, where the sign supplements and empties nature, that the disjunctive times of Fanon and Kristeva can be turned into the discourses of emergent cultural identities within, within a non-pluralistic politics of difference. Because as soon as it enters that sort of space of the multiculturalism, politics of difference, then there is the risk, at least for Baba, that these... Uh, these cultures will just simply become, uh, will just be reduced to the dominant framework in a sense, because it is then seen as, oh, we are all one, uh, we are all the same, any sort of, you know, discourse around that, that sort of rhetoric, which for, for Baba opens up the possibility of a sort of uh, reduction of cultural difference. And it is here that it, for, for me, gets rather complicated. Because Baba makes the claim um, that in the separation of language and reality, in the process of signification, there is no epistemological equivalence of subject and object, no possibility of the mimesis of being. So thinking about the way in which this, this possibility gets crushed or gets um, sort of nullified, but then he continues that it is at this point in the narrative of national time that the unison discourse produces its collective identification of the people, not as some transcendent national identity, but in a language of doubleness that arises from the ambivalent splitting of the pedagogical and the performative. So the people emerge in an uncanny moment of their present history as a ghostly imitation, eh, sorry, intimation of simultaneity, simultaneity across a homogeneous empty time. Now, what the what that means is uh, is a difficult one because if we think, for instance, of something like a national anthem, that is at one time both a performative and a pedagogical gesture. Where you know, thinking about the way in which it's being uh, discussed in uh, American politics now, where there is a certain demeanor expected of people when they are in the presence of the national anthem or when the national anthem is playing. And for those people that don't abide by said rules, they suffer certain consequences, which I denounce with all my power. But the way in which that, that falls in between performance and pedagogy is precisely in the way that it 
lays claim almost to neither, where it has entered a zone where it cannot be questioned to that sort of, to, to, to any degree. It is both something that teaches that idea of cultural identity, and it is something that just is, in the sort of performance. So, how, to think about the way in which Baba proposes something of a difference to that, or something of an oppositional politics, is, is a tricky one, because it seems as though he's not opposed to there being such things, right? I think you could locate example of, examples of a pedagogical and a performative in you know, the pre-colonial landscape. So it, it's almost as though he wants to integrate something of a new, or allow the, at least allow the possibility of new forms to develop. So this is, re, this is in opposition to, uh, as we established earlier, uh, his his distinction that his opposition sorry to Stuart Hall, in that he doesn't see like that end goal occurring, but rather than advocating for negation, wants to maintain a sort of negotiation. So for him, too often it is the slippage of signification that is celebrated in the articulation of difference at the expense of the this disturbing process of the overpowering of content by the signifier. The erasure of content in the invisible but insistent structure of linguistic difference does not lead us to some general, formal acknowledgement of the function of the sign. The ill-fitting role of language alienates content in the sense that it deprives it of an immediate access to a stable or holistic reference outside of itself. So whatever that means. But something of a maintenance of a possibility within both signification and out of it I, this stuff is sometimes very difficult, but I hope, like, God, if anyone hears me saying this, this is my plea, is anyone out there, for anyone listening to this that has another idea, I would certainly hope that you'd tell me why I'm stupid, because this is, this stuff is, is really difficult. So he ends this chapter after giving moving through a number of literary references from Salman Rushdie to some Benamian's work. Uh, he, he concludes this chapter by saying that it is for it is by living on the borderline of history and language, on the limits of race and gender, that we are in a position to translate the differences between them into a kind of solidarity. So to me that that sounds like a sort of another sort of homogenization. Can you have a solidarity unless there's some kind of engagement with uh, a common principle? I don't know if that's possible, but it, it sounds to me like this is a contradiction. But if, you know, we want to humor Baba here, we would say that that sort of solidarity is, is a solidarity welcome to a certain difference that, but as he did say, the nation welcomes said difference as well. Sounds like a contradiction to me, but... You know, we'll try to make sense of it. Or, there, I, I put it out there for y'all to make sense of it. I'll just, I'm just going to move on now. I'm not going to unravel that. Into the ninth chapter here, the post-colonial and the post-modern. So in what way do these two things intersect and diverge? Baba defines the post-colonial as, um, post, uh, as a perspective that resists the attempt at holistic forms of social ex explanation. It forces a recognition of the more complex cultural and political boundaries that exist on the cusp of these often opposed political spheres. And these opposed political spheres are made up of the third world and first world um, ideologies. But when we're dealing with a question like post-colonialism, we are making an assumption that we are actually coming after colonialism and there, there are many strands of post-colonialism that account for forms of neo-colonialism that permeate today. But in some part, there is a recognition of a an event that has passed, of an event that has finished, in a sense. When it, you know, if we really interrogate that term, it becomes difficult to state that there was even a, an event at all, precisely because this idea of colonization, although it manifested itself in the most broad, most violent ways, 
in the you know 19th 18th centuries 17th centuries 16th century all throughout the, all those centuries uh, such things did occur for a very long time so to suggest that such things would have ended in the recognition of a post we are opening ourselves up to a sort of erroneous assumption regarding what is now occurring as falling under the ruins of a sort of colonial practice when in fact these things are only ever continuing they, they never end and it seems odd to just place colonialism in this one little bracket and say here it was uh, there was a before and there's an after and this was the time in which it, it existed. It seems ironic to engage with it in that way, yet Baba does. And so this is what we're left with in this sort of analysis of the effects of colonialism on identity, on culture, in both, I guess, first world nations and third world nations. Uh, these are terms that I normally resist, but that's what we're left with. Post-colonialism is something that recognizes the effect to which these, these uh, expeditions did have on the construction of many of the institutions that cultural studies or that, you know, generally, or literary theory or critique in general, um, takes as its object. So, for instance, by disavowing the colonial moments as an enunciative present in the historical and epistemological condition of Western modernity, Foucault can say little about the transference, transferential relation between the West and its colonial history, which is just one of the many things that one could take Foucault to task on or for, but then, you know, I digress. Uh, Baba then continues that the combination of modern and archaic regimes of power produces unexpected forms of disciplinarity and governmentality that make Foucault's epistemes inappropriate, even obsolete. So this is not only to, for Baba to then explain why or what forms of power governmentality uh, derive from said, you know, uh, colonial projects, but he's also making apparent that the extent to, extent to which analysis or post-colonial analysis recognizes the effects that such things have had, and in that way it represents a sort of, uh, represents a sort of necessity to maintain such a critique. So we can't lose sight of it in that way. And especially when considering its uh, relationship to the postmodern, that would be more, I guess, inclined to look at things, rather ironically, to look at things as being kind of neutral, in a sense. That, there, that, that this thing called history has only ever been a product of a sort of, um, you know, simulacral effect or, or power relations. However, whatever postmodern theorists you like to throw in there, whereas there for Baba there is a history that has culminated into different that has resulted in various effects that the postmodern thinkers, without recognizing, fail. At least this is how Baba recognizes it in Foucault, fail to evaluate properly or to fail to adequately evaluate the extent to which there is a very real connection to real events in the formations of this thing, these things called power or governmentality. Now moving into the next chapter, chapter 10 by Brett alone, uh, Baba begins by asking how do we historicize the event of the dehistoricized by the thing that doesn't enter the, uh, the history books per se. Because like his opposition to those, I guess those postmodern critiques, in a sense, he wants to think about the way in which we can we can rethink our history in order for it to approach a sort of truth, which is very ironic given the beginning of this book. But in a sense, to approach a sort of a, a more real version of history, a more truthful one. So one example of this is with Toni Morrison's book *Beloved*, of which um, Baba writes that uh, her fiction uses interrogatively to establish the presence of a black literary work. So the act of rememoration, her concept, or Morrison's concept of the recreation, recreation of popular memory, 
turns the present of narrative enunciation into the haunting memorial of what has been excluded, excised, evicted, and for that very reason becomes the unheimlich space for the negotiation of identity and history. So one of the themes present in this book, Beloved, is uh, a sort of disjunction or contradiction or a sort of panic and terror that does not lend itself to an easy historical telos, but is rather something that, that is rather, it's contradictory, doesn't always make clear sense, but for that reason makes it no less true. So um, Baba reminds us that it has been my argument that historical agency is no less effective because it rides on the disjunctive or display circulation of rumor and panic. He continues, would such an ambivalent borderline of hybridity prevent us from specifying a political strategy or identifying a historical event? On the contrary, it would enhance our understanding of certain forms of political struggle. So, in a way, how understanding, how grasping those histories of people that fall outside of the purview system, or of the broad historical uh, narrative, opens up that possibility for this new political struggle or a political struggle that is in itself as valid, if not more valid, valid, that opens up that very possibility. And this will move us into the final chapter, very appropriately titled, How Newness Enters the World, Postmodern Space, Postcolonial Times, and the Trials of Cultural Translation. So he begins by stating that it is radical perversity, not sage political wisdom, that drives the intriguing will to knowledge of postcolonial discourse. So this, this sort of dialectic, how it is driven, how it is pushed. And in very much the same capacity, he just does, he takes his chapter to say the same thing over and over and over again without really answering the question how newness enters the world. But he takes time to think about, for instance, feminist uh, practices in relation to uh, Rushdie, or at least um, kind of in relation to the, to the fatwa where feminists have not fetishized the infamous naming of the prostitutes after Muhammad's wives, rather they have drawn attention to the politicized violence in the brothel and the bedroom, raising demands for the establishment of refuges, refugees for minority women coerced into marriages. Their response to the Rushdie affair reveals what they describe as the contradictory influences of feminist and multiculturalist policies adopted by the local state, mainly in labor-led councils. Then he goes on to, to state that Thinking about uh, Frederick Jameson here, which he takes a whole lot of time to talk about, and you know, I'm not, I don't know a whole lot about Jameson. I've personally, I've read like I've read the cult, the critique of culture, the postmodern thing, whatever it's called, and it, to be honest, it, it bored me to death. It's 500 pages of boring nonsense, but what he says of Jameson here is that his work, or like he proposes a genealogical materialism as a way of um, contesting a psychosexual racial logic. So it is too easy to see the discourses of the minority as symptoms of the postmodern condition. Jameson's claim that in the absence of a genuine class consciousness, the very lively social struggles of the current period are largely dispersed and anarchic does not sufficiently register the antagonistic displacement that minority discourses initiate across or across purposes with the di dialectics of class identities. So in that way, not so much answering the question for, uh, that he proposed for this chapter, but thinking about the rest of the book in the way in which these, um, I guess, opposing positions, these opposing classes or identities, how they resist and what form of resistance they necessarily take, precisely in their, in their being outside. And on that, like, it's very frustrating going through this because he, it, it's a lot of the same. But on, on, I've been saying that too often. Yeah, I'm doing the exact same thing. So then I'll just move right into chapter 12 here in the, the, the conclusion. Where he states that between you and us, Fanon opens up the enunciative space that does not simply contradict the metaphysical ideas of progress or racism or rationality. He distantiates them by repeating these ideas, makes them 
uncanny that by displacing them in a number of culturally contradictory and discursively estranged locations, so it's that undoing precisely by making apparent, by bringing into light those oppressive formulations that Baba is reiterating here. And he, he gives this really interesting perspective where he states that this is an attempt, at least this kind of neocolonial attempt, I, he would argue, to universalize the spatial fantasy of modern cultural communities as living their history contemporaneously in a homogenous empty time of the people as other, as the, of the people as one, sorry, that finally deprives minorities of those marginal liminal spaces from which they can intervene in the unifying and totalizing myths of the national culture. So this is really butting up against what I would suggest is like the cultural discussion around um, marginalized people where there is very much an emphasis on bringing people into the fold, right? Recognizing difference and allowing that difference to be understood, grasped, uh, acknowledged by the state, by anything like that. To which I think Baba would, has a very big problem with because he sees a sort of radicality present in the maintenance of such liminal spaces of those spaces that stand outside of the national cultural identity, or the zeitgeist, if you will, and can then be something that challenges it from the outside, because for him, challenging from the inside would be kind of, wouldn't get anywhere, right? Constantly running up against walls, it would, it would just simply fall apart. So it's not as though, he doesn't just want to subsume uh, minorities under the broad category of this basic liberal humanism, right? This this uh, argument that simply the um, rendering equal of all people has simply been an extension of the liberal humanist ideas of the, you know, rights of man or anything like that. But for him, he doesn't see such progress as occurring so neatly. Rather, progress, or what I will just call progress, is something that develops by there being some kind of contact with an oppositional force, something that stands outside of those very doctrines, which I think that, you know, you could very easily take Baba to task for this, because then it, you know, you can question to what extent, or how does this then risk ushering in other forms of, I guess, despotic control through the recognition of people being outside of the purview of the state, or to think of Arendt, uh, in her claim that the first and most important right is for people to simply have rights, what might happen if people are, fall outside of that rubric, if they fall outside of that framework? Which is something we, you know, we can consider and really uh, take Baba to task on, but I, that pretty much rounds this book off. It's really, I really enjoy this book. It, it, did, it does a lot for me. Um, or did a lot for me when I read it for the first time a few years ago. It's challenging. It's uh, it's challenging. It feels contradictory. It doesn't feel complete, really. And I, I don't know what other... I haven't read any other of Baba's books. I've, I've seen a few of his interviews and, and talks, but I'd be curious to see what else he's written, if he's re responded to himself at all in any later texts, because this was in the mid-'90s, I guess. But for anyone that made it this far, right, if you have anything to add or call me out on, I certainly hope you will. Just, you know, make it productive. Don't say, oh, you suck, you're stupid. Or do that. Whatever. Um, do whatever you want. But for those that did make it this far, thanks for listening, and I hope you got something out of this, because I know every time me getting the chance to look at this again has, has given me some, some stuff as well. But anyways, for those that listen this far, thanks a lot.